Okay, so let's move to the first invited speakers, who is Nicola Pancotti. He is a quantum research scientist at Amazon, and he will present his work on quantum mechanics, tensor networks, and machine learning. So, Nicola, let me put you as spotlight. Okay, and now you can share your presentation. Uh, let me just thank all the organizers for this very nice workshop and thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and I think this is a very, very nice initiative to bring together all different people from different backgrounds. I think it's very useful because we all have different gap languages and it's nice to fill the gaps and try to speak all the same language when we, when we speak about the same things more or less. So why I, I thought that would be... Um, nice today to talk a bit about uh, the origins at least as you said the, this met some of these methods came from physics so today i will give a bit of a, a background of what uh, what is my background and what where what is the, how they've been used more or less in physics and then how they've been moved uh, in the last few years uh, towards the uh, other fields like computer science and machine learning so let me start. Oh, sorry, uh, let me start off with thanking uh, all my collaborators from the past and from the present, and in particular Ivan Glasser, who whom I worked with very closely during my PhD, but also all the other people in Munich and in Berlin and uh, the Max Planck and the, and the universities. So um, the content of the talk is going to be as follows. So first of all, I will. I will, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, I know that the, the audience is very broad, so probably some people are going to get bored, but I hope just to put everybody on the same page, I will give a brief introduction uh, about uh, uh, how the basic things in quantum mechanics, uh, what are the basic description that we use in quantum mechanics, in particular, I will show how, what, what are the wave function, and in particular can be described as, described as vectors and what are observables which are basically the physical quantities that we want to measure in the real world outside us the, the microscopic world and uh, from here i will try to move I, I will try to make the connection from this mathematical description of the microscopic world to the to them to one of these the, the celebrated theory the tensor network which is uh, the moment uh, the state of the art numerical and also analytical technique to study quantum mechanical systems, at least in certain conditions. Uh, so, in particular, I will show that uh, tensor network uh, can be very efficient for certain kind of problem in linear algebra and the kind of problem that we're interested in in physics, in particular. But then from there, we'll move on to show some application that we tried to explore in the last few years about uh, how we could apply tensor network to machine learning and uh, what kind of problem can be attacked with tensor network. In particular, I will show uh, how uh, one can, maybe some, somebody is already familiar with this mapping, but there's a very general mapping between tensor network and probabilistic modeling. And I will show you a bit about this. And also we'll give some examples about some, some applications, really some, some supervised and supervised learning problems that we have attacked uh, with, our, uh, with our words. So let me start off with a crash course in quantum mechanics. So this is really two slides. Uh, I'll try to make it as, as little as physics as possible. Let's see if we, if we will succeed. So, the central object in quantum mechanics is a wave function and the wave function in at least in the simplest case uh, can be thought as a vector in the following way so uh, what you can think of uh, an, a number of arrows that here is like compasses like magnetic arrow, arrows that, that basically interact with each other and they can be either up or down or something in between if they are down we give to them the value zero, and if they're up, we're given the value one. And this basically defines, so the bit string that you see here defines completely the state of these, of these arrows. And this can describe many, many physical systems. This is just a, a model that can, can be used to describe them, basically the magnetization of many material. 
So in this notation, when we when we have a zero, the bit string can be mapped into some sort of uh, vector space or some sort of Hilbert space where the zero is mapped onto a vector, a uh, two-dimensional vector, one zero, and the one can be mapped into another two-dimensional vector, which is zero one. These two vectors are orthogonal and they're normalized. And here you can see on the right the famous Dirac notation or the bracket notation, which is used everywhere in physics, but it's really essentially the same thing. So this is zero and this is a vector. They represent the same thing. These are also qubits in quantum computation, if you're interested. Uh, this is basically, they are mathematically, they are exactly equivalent. So when we put many of them together, here, the way that we, we combine, we, we write mathematically the, the, the state, the wave function of a combined um, um, set of, uh, of arrows, in this case of particles, is basically going from a bit string to a tensor product of vectors. So here, as I, as I said before, you have two dimensional vectors and you can take tensor products of these vectors and you end up with a larger vector. This is the conventional Kronecker product that you're using in computer science. And once you take this Kronecker product, you end up with a very large vector. So depending on how many building blocks you have here, in this case, you have two times two times two, so it's gonna be two to, the, two to the four. This is the size of the, uh, the final vector. And this guy will give basically one possible basis state for a vector space. And the vector space is, can, be, can be basically spanned by, the, by this, orthogonal, but this orthogonal state, which is our simply just really, really a linear, linear superposition of, of our orthogonal vectors. Each of them are represented by a bit string. And we have two to the n possible bit string, which are given by how many basically arrows we have in this case. And this is it. So this is basically what a wave function is. So it's a linear combination of these bit strings that, that take this form, the tensor product of simple, very, very simple two dimensional vectors, at, at least in this simple example. The only constraint that we want to impose to this, uh, to this vector is that it's, it's, it's normalized. It's normalized to one because it has to, to, to represent a probability distribution. And this is the normalization. We use the modulus square because in general, this, this coefficient here that we call amplitude, they can be even complex. So this is a way to map a complex number into a real one and you want to have the sum of them uh, all, to, all to one. So um, of course, here we want to map them to some physical, to, we want to study some physical properties and we need to, to define some observable mathematically. And observable, observable is nothing but a matrix. So it's really a, a big matrix acting on a vector which spits out another vector. And this is using in many, many different things. Let me give you just two examples. One is the energy. So here we, you have a big matrix, which is H, and you apply the vector that I introduced before. Uh, just recall that uh, this vector uh, is, take, takes this form, this linear combination with different coefficients. And, and this simple function here, which is just the, the, the product of a matrix and a vector, and then another vector on the, on the left, transpose, this gives you the, is the, is the model that gives you the, 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 the expectation value of the energy. This is really a probabilistic expectation value of the energy for a given system. And you can, you can, one can play the same game with the magnetization, which you don't need to know physically what exactly is, but basically you count the number of up hours that you have, you subtract the number of down hours that you have, and the, and the result is what's called the magnetization. And this is a way, a simple way to compute it. So as a last bit of quantum mechanics, so in this crash course in quantum mechanics two slides, I want to tell you how things move. So here we, are, we have been talking all about static things and the celebrated Schrodinger equation tells us how things move, which, are, which is a very simple, linear uh, um, differential equation where you have vectors that depend on time. You can take, and the derivative with respect, of, with respect of time of this vector is equal to a matrix, which is the same matrix as here, is the energy of the system. But this really, these are vectors. These are the derivative with respect of time of the vector. And these are matrices that act on the vector. And the solution of the Schrodinger equation is this one on the right. Of course, if the number of these arrows or number of this tiny vector I showed at the beginning or the number of particles, these are all equivalent terms that we use, grows, then the, the size of this matrix become exponentially large with the number of these objects. And this, the computation in particular of this exponential here, for instance, becomes very, very demanding. 
So if you do research in quantum mechanics, you spend probably most of your life trying to compute these kind of things and they become very complicated. That's why uh, some physicists roughly 20 years ago, they came up with efficient algorithm to study subclasses of these vectors and matrices. So um, <clears throat> let's see how the tensor networks come into the game in this scenario where we have vectors and matrices which represent physical systems. And so here, let's start again with this, uh, with this notation. So we have the, the bracket notation of the same vector, which is a linear combination of basis states, which are nothing but, uh, again, a bit string. So you see here, x represents a bit string. x, uh, x is just a set of uh, one and zeros. And a matrix product state is nothing but a way to represent this amplitude in an efficient way. So in the general case, if this number n of, if your bit string becomes very long, uh, the number of different coefficient that you have here grows exponentially. Uh, you can see it because basically two to the n. But this matrix product state allow us to, 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 to explore a subset of this state is an efficient manner, which is very large. And the only, mm, basically the only intuition here, well, the only thing that we do, we, we just describe this coefficient in front of the, in front of the, the vectors, the web basers as a product of matrices, as a product of tensors. So once you specify the bit string that you're interested in, what, what the result is just really a product of one vector, which is the, the, first, the first one and a bunch of matrices and another vector here. So this really gives you a complex number at the end. So, you might wonder why this is interesting. Well, there are uh, there are theorems actually. So, uh, and in, in theoretical physics, there are really powerful theorem that tells us that if a physical if a physical system is arranged in one dimension, meaning that all the all the arrow, for instance, they lie in a line and they're not in a grid, for instance, just in one one dimensional line, and the vector fulfills the area law, which is a law in physics about the correlation of between the particles. Then, uh, then we know there's a theorem that tells us that matrix product state can represent them faithfully. So this class of matrix product states, so you see the requirements are very weak and the matrix product state is, uh, is a class of vectors that is very common and can really represent many different, um, many different states in the real world, at least for certain, for certain, certain geometries. Of course, as you can see here, the, 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 the analytical form of this object is rather annoying, it's a bit complicated. So that's why people came up at some point, came up with uh, graphical notations. And this is what I want to introduce now because it's gonna be as helpful in the future. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with the graphical notation, but just to be on the same page, let me introduce it again. So as I said, this is, this is a vector. This is a linear combination of basis vectors. And recall that this is just a bit string. And the idea is to associate some boxes to each of the each of the tensors, each of the matrices, if you want, that compose these matrix states. And you see here we have some edge tensors that have two legs, so they are ranked two tensors, and we have bulk tensor, they are ranked three tensor. So these objects are uh, basically once you multiply all of them, you contract all of them, you end up with the uh, with the right with the right amplitude. And this is much more convenient because building these diagrams really allows to to make calculation without making mistake with indices and this kind of things. This is really much more much more convenient. I'll show you in a second one example. Of course, one can do this also for matrices. Because if you if you want to represent things efficiently in this subspace, you need to have some some matrices. Let me stress that, for instance, many models in quantum mechanics, physical model, they for instance, when you want to represent the energy of some model, they 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 fall in, into this category. You can really represent them exactly. You can represent exponentially large matrices exactly into a matrix product operator. This is the name of this this fantasy in physics. And these are matrices and these are vectors. So basically these are the building block of linear algebra that we're gonna use uh, also later uh, in the talk, but that's a use in uh, everyday life by physicists working in condensed matter. So just for a second example, I'll show you that uh, 
how efficient th this is. And this is, I mean, this is always a bit surprising, but uh, the one can, this is a very nasty diagram, but one can show that the multiplication between a matrix and a vector, which spits out another vector, can be reduced to basically uh, from a n squared complexity to a logarithmic complexity. So here you have the complexity of multiplying an operator in the matrix product form operator, sorry, a matrix in the matrix front, uh, form operator and a vector in the matrix product state form is really, uh, the, the corresponding complexity is really logarithm, the logarithm of the dimension, which is something which doesn't, it's, it's, it's satisfied only for, in, in rare cases. As, as you can see, if you, uh, the, the only thing that one has to perform in order to, 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 to perform the multiplication between the matrix and the vector is just to sum over the, the indices that match with each other. So if one sum over the indices, which is a tensor contraction, if you want, is a tensor sum, then one ends up with another matrix product state. Eventually, the, this dimension here will be larger. It's not always the case, but it's generally it is the case. But you're still in the family of matrix product state. And this is very efficient. I mean, normally you don't have a, a matrix vector multiplication, which requires only log complexity of the total system size. Okay, so. This was just a hint, I, and also the, the matrix vector multiplication was just an example. Uh, there are many other calculations that can be done efficiently. One can compute the norm of vectors, can compute the norm of matrices, the Frobenius norm of matrices, can compute the extremal eigenvalue and eigenvectors of matrices. Uh, there are many calculations that can be done efficiently in this form. And this was just an example, just to give you a, a bit the, the overview of the thing. So uh, let me dive a bit on the on the results that uh, that that we had in the last few years. So and I would like to start again from the from this representation of vectors. So here we start from a wave function from a quantum state, which is nothing but a vector in a in a linear space in a Hilbert space, which is decomposed as a linear combination of orthogonal vectors with uh, complex uh, coefficients in front. So one can come up with many different representations, right? So as we said before, the number of these coefficients that you have to store in your computer if you want to simulate the system grows exponentially. So one really has to come up with some approximation to it. And one is the one I introduced now, and the symmetric product state, which, which is basically state of the art, at least for, for some, in some cases. But there are many others. So one is that maybe people there have a background in machine learning, have, probably heard all physicists also have heard about a Boltzmann machine, which is basically an energy model where, where one assumed that uh, there is some energy, there's a some energy function that describes the interaction between some visible and hidden variables, takes the exponential of this function and marginalize over the hidden variables. And this defines again, a function that takes as an input a bit string and outputs a complex number. As, as was the case for metrics product states. And of course, I mean, there are many, many different examples. Here we'll give just four examples. Uh, one is string bond states. This is a less known class of tensor network, which is becoming a bit more popular in physics now. But the idea is that it's very similar, you see, to a metrics product state. The only difference is that the tensors here have an additional index, J, and a product in front. So it's like taking many different realization of your matrix product state and, and, and take copies of them and, and connect them uh, th uh, through the physical dimension, sorry, through the, the X index here. So this is another example and it will be clear in a second why I'm introducing this example. So let me introduce the, four, the fourth uh, class of models that actually was very successful lately. There was a science paper by Matthias Caleo um, sorry, um, Giuseppe Carleo and Matthias Freyer about using this kind of vectors to describe certain class of states in quantum mechanics and was really a revolution. I mean, it was a paper from three years ago and now a lot of people in physics are trying to use this machine learning inspired state to describe quantum systems. So this is just really a restricted Boltzmann machine, the one you're familiar with in machine learning. And the idea is that is exactly the same as the normal Boltzmann machine, apart that you impose some, some constrained connectivity of the graph. 
you have a bipartite graph and things are connected only only in this way so from the visible to the hidden there's no connection between the hidden if this is the case then one can work out this sum and end up with this amplitude with this function here and you see these are all different examples that one can choose for modeling a certain coefficient a certain vector which is of an exponentially large space so it's an approximation to approximate uh, vectors in a, in a Hilbert space, space which is very large. So the reason why I introduced all of this uh, is because I wanted to, to just make the statement that one, one of our results is that, which actually is the result that really inspired us to move a bit towards machine learning from our more physical point of view that we had before, which is that what we managed to show in one of these paper, which is basically more physical motivation, was that uh, this restricted bosom machine can be actually exactly mapped onto these string bond states, which is a class of tensor networks. And, and so this direction is true, this other direction is not true. So the string bond state is, is a larger class than restricted bosom machines. And um, so, but maybe if you're familiar with restricted bosom machine, you also know that uh, they are a class, they are a subclass of graphical models. So later I will show you how this mapping can be actually generalized. Actually, no, probably. Well, no, first I will introduce some, uh, something about the graphical models. So uh, in case you're not familiar with them, graphical models are uh, classical probabilistic models uh, where one assumes a certain factorization of the probability density function. So what does it mean? It means that if we want to model the probability distribution of a system given five variables that take discrete values, so x1 to x5. So in order to, well, of course, in this case, everything can be done, but say that the number of variables scales very much. So you end up with hundreds of, or, or even thousands of, of variables here. Then one really has to introduce some sort of factorization. Otherwise it, any calculation becomes unreachable. And they are called graphical models because there is a graphical notation for them. And the graphical notation goes as follows. Basically, you have your, uh, your variables and they are connected by, by some functions, which defines basically the correlation among, among the, 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 the variables that you want to describe. And these things really define a probability density. So that you can use to anything basically it has to do with probabilistic modeling. And maybe not, uh, not everybody is familiar with this mapping. This is something which, depending on the community, is kind of uh, well known. But uh, there is a simple, very simple mapping between probabilistic models and tensor networks if the variables take uh, discrete values. So if the variables take discrete values, you can always map it onto, onto some sort of tensor network where now the function, they really become tensors. So you can really expand them. This would be a matrix. It would be a rank three tensor. It would be another matrix. You can do this both for models, hidden graphical models where you all have visible variables, like in this case, but also when you have hidden variables, like in this case. So in this case, you would have a bunch of hidden variables that you want to marginalize upon and your ending probability distribution, the probability that mass function, um, depending on the community, people could be different. And um, so one can write these things again as a, as a tensor network, and uh, this would be uh, the, the diagram. And once you group things in a, in a certain way, you'd see that uh, you end up with some sort of uh, matrix product state. This is the exact diagram of the matrix product state of tensor train. Uh, so I didn't mention earlier, matrix product state are basically in computer science now are called tensor train. And um, right. So this map, this mapping is always possible, by the way. So whenever you have some factorization, you can always map it. If the, the, the variables are discrete, you can always map into some sort of tensor network by defining the right tensor. Then, then of course, the complex, complexity is roughly the same. It's just it might be in one case or the other, you can get more insight about the model if you map into a tensor or if you map it back to the graphical model. Uh, so let's just give me a quick let me just give you a quick example about the restricted bots machine I showed you early, earlier. So in particular, if the restricted bots machine, the bipartite graph of the restricted bots machine has only local connection in this sense that is not all, but just to the nearest neighbors, like in this case, 
then one can show very easily that, that the restricted Boltzmann machine can be mapped exactly onto a matrix product state. Uh, let me stress that this, these mappings are not interesting only for physics. This also, the, the restricted Boltzmann machine that we use in physics is the same that is being used in computer science and machine learning. So these mappings works exact, do work exactly the same. And when you allow no local connection, meaning connection all to all, like in this bipartite graph, like in this case, well, then you end up with the, the class of tensor network I told you before, which is called string bond states. As you can see here, if you recall the definition of string bond state, which was just a product of matrix product state, each, each row here is a matrix product state and they're connected together by this tensor, which is called a copy tensor, which is basically connects together all these, uh, all these legs of these different tensors. Right, so let me introduce, uh, of course, I mean, uh, here, this is everything very theoretical and very, very abstract, but I mean, what we wanted to show that uh, we can have some practical application. And of course we start from image classification and we, I will show you a couple of toy models where, where we actually, where we actually applied it. So one is image classification that I don't need to teach you. I'm, I'm sure you all know much better than I do. And, and here the idea is a very simplified version of it, but say that you want to find the probability that given a certain image, uh, you get a certain, you can label it with a certain label. And the, if you want the, the, the core, um, the core, um, choices that you have to make in order to make this kind of uh, optimization are to choose a model, choose a probability uh, distribution. So basically something that describes your data and a cost function. So what allows you to really, what, what you want to optimize. And in particular, when you choose a model, you can choose whatever you want. You can choose matrix product state, you can choose string bond states, like in this case, you can choose restricted box machine, you can use convolutional neural network, you can use very complicated, um, models. So what we did, we, we, we tried different different approaches, some with tensor networks, some with the deep, deep neural networks, some with a combination of the two. So these tensor networks are very flexible in this sense. They can really be combined with all, all other models coming from, from, from deep learning, depending on the kind of application one wants to make. And we found uh, kind of interesting results uh, for sight. I mean, of course, this was just um, a toy model, but they, we, we started to compare uh, some classical models with more advanced models. And now our, now our classification, given that, so let me stress that here for this model, we really have a perfect mathematical grasp of what's happening. So we really understand everything in every little detail. Whereas uh, when we go to the, to the realm of, of deep neural network, things become a bit more complicated. So what we were trying to do to understand how far we could push this model in order to, to, do, to solve for some, this task. And this is, something, this is something that we did and we, the, the underlying uh, roles here that you can see, they involve in one way or the other string bound states in particular, in this way, just pure string bound state for classification. And here is just uh, is a string bond state uh, combined to a convolution neural network, and they can achieve very nice and good results. So this is not the only thing one can do with tensor networks. They are probabilistic models, right? In a sense, so one can really apply them for a broad class of of problems. And one is maximum likelihood estimations. So in this case, it's slightly different. You have data, but you don't have labels. So you have a bunch of data. You want to learn the probability distribution. Around, uh, around this data. And there are many reasons to do that. Some is inference or, I don't know, sampling. There, there are many reasons. In all the quantitative science, people try to do some sort of fitting of the probability distribution of the data somehow. But the, the main problem of doing this is that one has to compute the, 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 the normalization of the, of, the, of the, well, not necessarily, but if you really want to have the probability distribution of one has really to compute the, the norm of the probability distribution or the partition function, as it's called in, in statistical physics. And, and what you end up optimizing is, is optim optimizing into some sort of uh, likelihood function of this form where you can either optimize from data in this way or from uh, another distribution. So basically, uh, 
This is just a KL divergence, which is called uh, relative entropy in physics. And um, so, right. So once you optimize this thing, you can you can find the best prob in, in within your model. You can find the best probability distribution that uh, that fits your data. But of course, you can see from here that you really need to know what is the partition function or the normal wave distribution, which is very hard in general to compute. Normally, you cannot compute it for deep neural networks or for other models. But there are some models of tensor networks that have been developed in physics for completely different reasons that can actually allow to compute this function here, this normalization, this at here. And uh, let me introduce you some of the ones we looked at. So one is the, well, uh, we, we did introduce all, uh, actually they were uh, already introduced by different community in different approaches. What we did in this work is to compare the descriptive power. And uh, in particular, I'm, I already introduced and probably many of you are already familiar with the tensor train, which is uh, the, this is the composition as, uh, as I was telling before. <clears throat> then the Bohr machine, which is more a physics -y point of view, the same thing. So you see here, we are modeling probability distribution. So you want that all the possible entries of the tensors, given uh, configuration of your, of your variables here is a real and positive number. It's really a probability. And in order to do that with a matrix product state or with a tensor train of this kind, you kind of, have, it's, it's not so strict, but you kind of have to impose that the tensor are real and positive. The entries of the tensor are real and positive, which is a nonlinear constraint. If instead of doing this, you, you, you take this kind of other tensor network, which has, we basically take the MPS and the, and the, a copy of the MPS, but with the matrices, with the dagger emission conjugate, it. Then all the entries, once you identify the, the, upper, the upper legs with the lo lower legs, then all the entries end up to be real and positive without any nonlinear constraints. <clears throat> and this is even a broader class, which basically has the same idea, but allow, basically you can add a, a, an additional leg and, 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 and uh, yes, this, uh, this is basically in physics is a kind of well known model and it's called locally purified state and was not used to our knowledge before for probabilistic modeling. But I will show you in a second that, uh, that something about the descriptive power. Let me stress that for all these models, you can compute efficiently the partition function or the norm. And we chose this exactly for this reason. We wanted something for which we could compute efficiently everything we wanted. And this is one kind of one kind of network, one, one type of tensor network for which, well, few types of tensor network for which uh, we could do something like that. And um, so maybe I should also stress that hidden Markov models also fall, fall in this category. So hidden Markov model are a subclass of basically tensor train with positive, um, positive tensors, positive entries in the tensors. So what we did in this work uh, last year, yes, last year, well, no, two years ago, 2021, is to show that, uh, to, to find some sort of, uh, to, to, to explore the expressive power of all these models. So what we, what we were looking were some examples where we can represent one probability distribution efficiently with one model and not efficiently with the other model. And we came up with this diagram, which basically gives us sort of the, the rough understanding of how things going. So if you, if you see there is no, in, in this case, for instance, the blue line is a locally purified state, which is the last tensor network they introduced. And here, this is so large that it means that there is some examples, there, there exists some probability distribution that can be approximated efficiently by this, actually exactly by this uh, locally purified state but they will require a scaling number of parameters if you want to represent them with uh, locally purified states uh, with only real, for instance. And um, so maybe earlier I didn't stress this enough. So the, the reason why we like to take this kind of weird form for the uh, for, for these tensor networks is because this allows us also to use not only real, but also complex and negative, whatever we want, whatever, whatever, kind of uh, scalars we want to use here, we can use as long as at the end we take the, the modulus square, which is basically guaranteed by this A, A permission conjugate. 
Okay. <clears throat> so yes, we also apply this model to some real to some real problems. So uh, this is well real problems. It's kind of hard to find the right application for these things, and there's a lot of research on that at the moment. Because I mean, probably what we looked at so far is not the best application for tense metrics, but we apply this to random distribution and um, and uh, basically try to optimize the the overlap between random distribution and our ansatz. And as you can see, our model uh, could perform rather well. And uh, also to real data set that we took from online. So we took some data set from online and tried to optimize, try to find the optimal, uh, so try and find, trying to minimize the, 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 the likelihood, uh, the negative likelihood for this, for this model and try to feed them with our, with this all locally purified state, all this physics inspired um, model and tensor network that I show you earlier. So maybe I think I'm a bit over time, but I'm almost done. Um, so the conclusion uh, goes as follows. So I hope that the, the crash course in quantum mechanics uh, gave, left you something. If not, uh, feel free to, to contact me privately or ask questions in the Q&A. Um, so I hope that I show you that kind of many things in quantum mechanics in the microscopic world can be described by linear, by linear algebra, by really Hilbert space in the linear Hilbert spaces. And that's, uh, of course, tensor network play a predominant role, particularly when, when this kind of vectors and matrices fulfill the particular properties. And, and, and uh, I also showed you uh, this kind of simple mapping between graphical models and tensor networks which uh, basically allows us to use tensor network for a number of applications, which are classifications, uh, modeling probabilistic theories. And uh, maybe the thing that as a physicist, we like to, to push very much is really understanding what's going on. So really try to, to grasp really the, the un, really not use, we don't like to use black box in general. Uh, and I think we think the tensor network can help the machine learning community to to extract some more deep, some some more knowledge, mathematical knowledge insights. I, I mean, I, I, maybe it was not too clear from my talk, but the tensor network, at least from the physics point of view, they really come with a very very rich mathematical formulation that still can be explored for many applications outside physics, because, because as I showed you, it's just basically linear algebra of matrices and vectors. So with this, I uh, would like to thank you for, for the attention and for the invitation. Thank you, Thanks Nicola. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Personally, I enjoyed very much your paper with Glasser and Sirac about this mapping between uh, probabilistic models and tensor network. I think that is very, very interesting to, to Thanks. explore. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we, we have like three or four minutes for questions. There are a few questions in the chat. Can you read and give quick answers if possible? Um, yes, one second. I'm just trying to find the first one. I can read for you if you want, but the first one is from Chidin. So is that the one, uh, the relationship of graphical models? Yes. Uh, with tensor networks uh, is presented nicely. I'm wondering how to use such, uh, thank you, by the way. <laughs> I'm wondering uh, how to use such relationship in machine learning. What is the benefit we may have in making such a relationship? Right, uh, this is a good question. So this is an exact mapping. So it's really one-to-one. -one. Uh, so it, you don't really, if you can map one to the other, you don't really gain much, but maybe uh, at the, so, one of the things, one of the, our claims is that uh, by using other ideas coming from physics, for instance, the fact that you would take, uh, instead of measuring probabilities in the one norm, which is the convention in mathematics and in also in computer science, you would start to use the two norm, which is used in physics. Uh, then you might gain something in descriptive power. So meaning that you can use less parameters to describe the same probability distribution. So this is something which is um, which doesn't come directly from the mapping, uh, but uh, sort of like uh, part of the same story, I would say. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if you ask me strictly speaking, if if the mapping per se is useful, I I, I I've, I'm not sure. But the one thing is that maybe yes, there is something actually. There are a lot of tools coming from from linear algebra uh, of of these tensor networks, like uh, what in physics is called transfer matrix and a gauge condition that you can impose to these to these tensor networks that I don't think they're so simple to see in the other formulation. It's just a matter of language. Of course, you can translate everything to everything because they are the same object mathematically. But I think in the linear algebra language, things are a bit more, I don't know, maybe it's my background, but are a bit more accessible. Okay, there's a question from Guillaume. Oh, uh, pro probabilistic graphical models over discrete random variables can be seen as a special case of tensor network. Is there a similar equivalent result from previous over continuous random variables? So uh, here the question is, uh, so I was talking about discrete variables and the question is about, uh, is about uh, uh, continuous variables. So uh, it's not so simple. I mean, when you go to the continuous, there's a lot of research in physics because uh, we think the space is continuous. <laughs> And there are some examples of space and, I mean, also, so if you think that's, uh, that's the, um, what we call the physical dimension, the, the, okay. So if the physical dimension can be a continuous variable, right? So there's a lot of research, it can, can describe, for instance, the position of a particle. And that's, of course, a continuous function. And there are many uh, examples uh, that people, so th there exists continuous matrix product states, for instance. So oh. there, are, there are some, some, some examples. They also exist in two dimension and higher dimension. Uh, but whenever you go to the continuous, then you don't talk anymore about uh, simple quantum mechanics, in this case, linear algebra, these kind of things. You, go, you talk about field theories which have uh, kind of many problems, divergences and these kind of things. So mathematically they can be formulated and they are also rather elegant, some of them. I can, I can point to you some papers where continuous MPS were introduced. Also, there's a recent PRX paper about continuous uh, PEPs in two dimensions. Uh, but mathematically they are very nice, but numerically they're a bit, mm, yeah, uh, I didn't see any, uh, very convincing application yet. So the continuous limit is very hard. <laughs> okay, there, there are a couple more questions, but maybe we have time only for one. Uh, uh, I have to choose which one. <laughs> <laughs> you can choose. <laughs> I go. I go in order chronologically. Okay, so without. Okay. <laughs> You show the string bond state can be uh, can can achieve very good results on image classification, but are not yet able to get better performances than neural network. What do you think are the missing ingredient to be competitive with neural networks? Uh, is it engineering effort or for optimization of tensor network or uh, introducing nonlinearity in tensor network on something else? Uh, so. For sure, no linearity is intense. Okay, so tensor networks are already nonlinear in a certain way, so they can describe nonlinear function. But it's true that they're not since they are not their nonlinearity is not enough. Um, so, I mean, what what I think that the, the, the tensor network really don't have yet is really this, at least for image recognition, for instance, is the hierarchical structure of of convolutional neural networks. Is really trying to extract the most important features every every step of the ladder, right? And you can design tensor network of this type, but then you end up with something which is very similar of a convolution neural network. So basically, you're mapping a convolution neural network to a tensor network, which can be done again, but then you lose a lot of uh, the nice properties of tensor network that that you can study. Of course, optimization can be improved, but here these are all models again that you can optimize. Um, well, yeah, I mean, 
whenever you use these models like string bound states, uh, you lose the powerful algorithm for optimization that you you have uh, for matrix product states, for instance. And I, mm -hmm. I, what I what I mean is the, the density matrix normalization group algor uh, algorithms. You lose it because you, you basically you cannot compute the norm of the state is 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 a volume loss state in the physics language. So you. Um, and you cannot just the MRG doesn't work anymore. So yes, there might be better optimization technique to to optimize string bound state. And the way we did it was really brute force. So one can really exploit the fact that you have a geometry and locality of the tens of the tensor network. But um, yeah, uh, it, 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 well, the, the the thing is that also maybe the the, the short answer would be that uh, convolutional neural network are very good at doing what they're doing. And tensor network, maybe that's not the most natural application for tensor network. Maybe we should find some some better application. Maybe even coming from linear algebra, mm -hmm. that uh, can be very impactful. Okay, okay, Nicola. Thanks, thanks again for for the talk and for answering the question. We we have no more time. Unfortunately, we need to switch to the next invited talk. So, thanks again. Thanks, thanks everyone.